All right. Well, today on the show, we have Bobby Williams with us. Bobby, thanks so much for coming on the Churchology podcast. Yeah, Mark, I'm excited to be here, man. I'm, I'm pumped. And uh, as we were talking about earlier, I'm just, I'm so glad that, that you're doing this. I think it's a, a super helpful podcast and I, I've loved every episode so far. Well, great. Awesome. So Bobby, why don't you uh, give us a little bit of your story? Tell us about who you are, what you're, what you're into, where you work at. Yeah, so uh, I am um, Bobby Williams, and I work uh, as a lead pastor. Uh, we uh, we started a church about eleven years ago, uh, twelve years ago, uh, actually. I just forgot. We <laughs> just so you forget things in a pandemic, I guess. Uh, and so we uh, we're, we're twelve years old, um, multi-site church, uh, rural context. So we're in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and and Clinton, Tennessee. And um, been doing this for for about twelve years as a lead pastor and church planner. And uh, in my spare time, all that extra spare time that I have uh, from pastoring a church, I also get to be the community director for a company called Church Fuel, uh, where I get to do ministry coaching and content creation and uh, helping make practical resources for churches. Great, that's great. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. One of the things that, uh, that I wanted to focus on that you and I had talked about uh, in setting this up is just your story of burnout. And uh, so many leaders, uh, even church leaders, experience burnout, go through it. We're going to uh, talk about that. And so, so Bobby, just tell us, so there's your story, there's your context there in Tennessee. And can you give us a little bit of your story with burnout? Yeah, sure, man. I, um, so our, my story is a, a bit of a two-part story, I think. And, um, you know, early on in our um, church planting days, uh, when we were still a very young church and, you know, honestly, just trying to, to figure out who we were, what we were doing, uh, you know, is when I experienced my first season of, of near burnout, I think. And, um, you know, I'll just tell you a quick story. We, uh, we had started our church. We'd been meeting for a couple of months. Uh, I think we launched our church around Easter. Uh, so it was like April or so, March, April, uh, in, you know, 12 years ago. And, um, you know, things were going okay. We didn't, we didn't launch huge. Uh, you know, we, we probably had a hundred or so people, you know, showing up on, on launch day and, and kind of got going from there. But, uh, slowly, uh, as most churches do, I didn't know this as a new church planner, but those of you that have planted churches, you, you know, this, uh, most of you do, if you're a normal church plant, but, you know, we went, we started here and we kind of went, you know, we went down a little bit, you know, the next Sunday. Sunday and, and so on. And so uh, we went through the spring, went through the summer, things were going okay. Uh, we got to the fall and um, we had just a, a really strange day that happened in the fall. So everybody, everybody was telling me at the time and, and Mark, they probably told you this too, uh, but they were like, the fall is like your hot time. Like you're going to grow during the fall. The fall is big, you know? And we kind of thought that too, except for whatever reason, that first year, uh, it, what, it did not go that way. <laughs> we, we, did, we did not grow uh, during the fall. In fact, uh, I could probably write a book on what not to do your first year as a church planner. And um, so uh, th this really strange thing happened. We, uh, it was a, an October Sunday. And uh, we were set up, we were set up and tear down mobile church at the time. And so uh, we had set everything up, the band was, you know, warmed up, everything was screens were up, everything was, you know, kids ministry was going, I was out in the, the lobby. And, you know, greeting people. And I thought I'd been greeting several people as they came in. Apparently, all I was really greeting was volunteers that were running late, apparently. And so um, <laughs> we, I looked at my watch and it was past, it was like five minutes past time that we should, I should have been hearing music from our band playing. And I didn't hear anything. So I thought, oh no, there's like a technical difficulty, you know, something, something's going on. So I walk into uh, our auditorium area. I walk in there and uh, our worship leader, the band is on stage, the lights are down. Our worship leader is, is up there and he's just kind of like talking to the band, like just having a conversation, you know, with them, like, 
you know, and I'm, I'm looking at my watch. I'm thinking, man, you guys should be playing music right now. Like what's, what's going on? And I'm kind of standing there just waiting for him to turn around. And so he turns around, I'm like, you know, pointing at my watch. I'm like, well, bro, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and he just looks at me, Mark, and he goes, take a look around. There ain't nobody in here. Hmm. And I turn around and look and uh, Mark, I'm not, I'm not joking. There was one person in the auditorium that wasn't, that there was our, our, our sound crew, you know, running lights and, and screens yeah. and the band and one person sitting in the corner, one person I'd never seen before. They were a first time guest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one, one person sitting in the very back corner and, you know, they kind of waved at me like, Hey, I'm here. And, uh, <laughs> so I blacked out. I'm not like, I, bl I blacked out. I have, I have no, not in anger, just in fear. Like my, my greatest fear has just happened. Nobody came to church that day yep. outside of volunteers. Nobody came to church that day and there was worship. And my wife told me I preached a message. I could not, I can't tell you what it was about. Can't tell you what I said. Um, we packed everything up. I went home that day and I went to bed and I, I you know, I told my wife, uh, we had, a, uh, my son was, was little at the time, you know, so he was a baby. And, um, I just told her, I said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bed, you know, I love you, but I, I I'm going to bed. And I, I, it was about one, one thirty in the afternoon and I slept till about 6am the next morning. I was just, I, I don't know what happened. And so um, to, to wrap that up. So at the time I was in a, I was in a coaching uh, mentorship program um, at, at another church. Um, and we had every Monday, we were supposed to send an email to them and say, Hey, here's how Sunday went. And so I was dreading sending this email. And so, because I knew I was going to get asked about it. And so you know, by the end of the day, Monday, I finally worked up the courage to send this email. And I, I send this email and in the email, I, I, I still have the email, but in the email I wrote, you know, Hey, uh, this is what happened on Sunday. Um, and I'm ready. I'm done. Like I didn't sign up for this. This has been harder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, I, I think, I think this is it you know, I, I'm probably going to, we're probably going to just wrap it up, you know, this mm -hmm. week. And, and typically I would send that email on Mondays and I would get a response uh, pretty quickly. I didn't get a response Tuesday, no response Wednesday, no response on Thursday. I had to be there in person for our monthly gathering. So I didn't want to go obviously, and, but I went anyway and I showed up and I was there and there was like 10 other pastors in this, this group of, of mentoring uh, that was taking place and uh, here at this church. And so um, I, I go through the whole day and uh, the, uh, the pastor who was my mentor there, he, he didn't say anything to me. Like he didn't even, like he didn't even talk to me. I mean, you know, there's only 10 of us in the room and he's talked basically to everybody and hasn't, hasn't spoken to me yet. And so I'm thinking, okay, either he didn't get the email or he got it. And he's just like, yeah, go ahead and quit joker. Like, yeah, yeah go get out. Right. That's what like, uh, that's what I'm telling myself, right? That's what I feel like yeah, Satan's telling me in my soul and get to the end of the day and I'm walking out. And as I'm walking out, you know, I'm, I'm telling everybody bye honestly believing that this is probably the last time I'm going to see you guys. Like, cause I'm not coming back. Cause I'm, I'm going to go sell hot dogs. And, and that's, that's what I want to do with the rest of my life. Like mustard, ketchup, relish. That's it. Like those are the only decisions that need to be made. And as I'm walking out, he, uh, the pastor, he, um, he calls me over. He's like, Hey, Hey, Bobby, wait, before you go, I want to, want to talk to you for just a moment. And I'm thinking, Oh no, here it comes. Right. And so we walk out in the hall and I, you know, obviously those of you listening to the podcast, you can't, you can't see me. I'm, I'm short. I'm like five, seven, not very tall. Well, this guy's like six, 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 seven, it's a huge guy. And so I'm already looking up at me and, and I'm not exaggerating when I, when I say this, he, he walks over to me, he's standing in front of me and he says, Hey, I got your email on Monday and I've been waiting for you to get here today to, to talk to you. 
and he grabs me by my shirt and lifts me up by the collar of my shirt where I am on my tippy toes, you know, like just like lift, literally lifts me up in the air and looks me dead in the eye. And he tells me, he says, Bobby, if you quit, I'll kill you. <laughs> and he put me down and I saw the crazy in his eyes, right? Like I, I, I just, I saw it and, I, and he was like, I, I believe it. Like I'd be in the bottom of a lake if I quit. And, uh, and so I like, you know, it was like a three hour drive home. I like blubbered and cried all the way home, you know, just praying and, you, you know, just tore up, man. And so, so, but, but I, I tell that story because like I was, I was there, I was literally, I'd already had some conversations with some people. I'd already have some conversations with my wife. I was like, man, I'm, I know we're only like eight months into this whole thing, but I'm done. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to quit. And, and, but here, here's the thing. The reason why I tell that story is, is as I tell that to say that, that really set me up as I never really truly, I, I don't think I ever really dealt with like all of that stuff, you know, like I, like I felt it and I, I talked about it a little bit, but I didn't really talk about it much outside of that. Um, and so, uh, fast forward like a year or two later, I had gone, um, I'd gone to Miami to help train some pastors uh, through our, our church planning network and uh, had been with this group of guys for like six days. Uh, it was very intensive, uh, come back from that trip. And when I came back from that trip, like I realized that it was in the middle of the winter time and I realized something that I did not know about myself before is I hit a low, like I was just done. Like I was drained, I was tired. Um, and so I found out two things about myself. Number one is I had not dealt with some things in my past, okay. um, especially with, with coming to near quitting. Um, I just kept going. I, I lived in the mentality of, you know what, just pull yourself up, bro. Like, you know, wipe the dirt off and get moving. Like there, you got no time to cry. You got no time to, uh, to slow down. Like you're trying to build this church, forgetting that Jesus said he would build the church, you know, so I'm putting all that on my shoulders. Uh, and on top of all of that, I realized that I, I was dealing with seasonal depression. So like wintertime, not much sun, cold, I hate, I hate the cold weather. Uh, and, I, and I was dealing with some seasonal depression. I didn't know that about myself. And so I didn't know me, right? Like I, I, I didn't know who I was. And all of that kind of came crashing all at the same time. And so, um, and so I realized that, that the rate of speed that I'd been running at uh, had, had just drained me out. And so I was, I, I was in a, a really tough spot, uh, you know, a tough spot trying to figure out if I, you know, if I wanted to continue being a pastor, if I wanted to, you know, could I be a husband and a dad, you know, could I be a mentor to, to guys that I was coaching? Uh, and so it, it was some dark moments and some dark days where I, where I was really uh, teetering on that place of, you know, do I keep going or do we just go ahead and throw in the towel here? Yeah. And so let's back up for, for a minute. We use that term burnout. Everybody uses that word. You hear it a lot. How would you define burnout? Yeah. Burnout is, um, man, it's, I would define burnout as uh, a place where uh, you, you have zero motivation. Um, you, and, and burnout is where you just don't care. Yeah. Like, like I, you just don't care. Like you don't care. Okay. Well, uh, all right. So if anybody show, nobody's going to show up, well, I don't care. You know, it'd make it easier for me to quit, you know, because I can be like, Hey, nobody's coming. So uh, I can just quit it and nobody will care because nobody's here. Right. So there's no motivation. There's no care. There's, um, uh, I think that, uh, you, you know, I think people experience it differently. I think sometimes depression can, uh, can be a part of burnout. Um, also I think, I, I think, 
part of burnout can also bring about a, a sense of um, freedom in a way, you know, uh, okay. freedom from responsibilities, right? Uh, the responsibilities of, of leading a church or, you know, having people to depend on you uh, as they do for their spiritual care and shepherding and, and that kind of thing. And so there's, there's almost a sense of freedom that, that can kind of come with that, but it's a false freedom, right? It's a false freedom because uh, that's not what, that's not what God called you to. And, and, and so you, it's, it's the, it's the, the prodigal son freedom, right? I've, I've ran and I've got all this freedom to do whatever it is that I want to do. And I don't have to worry about the repercussions. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do me. And uh, it's the false freedom. So, so I think all of that, when I, when I think about burnout, that, that's what I typically think about. Yeah. And for you, you mentioned there were two things that really seemed to, to get you into that place. One of those is you said you had not dealt with some things in your past. Uh, yeah. Could you go into detail, maybe talk a little bit more about what, the, what that might mean? What, what were those things? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I hadn't really, you know, for me, I hadn't dealt with, um, I hadn't dealt with the fact that uh, I had had some, I, so I, I have great parents and uh, they're still married today, uh, you know, 40, gosh, 40 plus years, I think they've been married. And so, um, I, you know, so I, I've got great parents, love my mom and dad to death. But growing up, my, my dad and I just, we did not get along uh, at all. You know, I, when I say at all, I don't want to say like it was horrible, um, but we just, we just had our issues. And as I got older, uh, you know, we, we, we even had some other issues, you know, with, with one another. Mm -hmm. And, and I never, I, I never talked about that. I never, I never dealt with that. And, and I hear this a lot from, from other pastors is these father issues. Right. Yeah. And so I, I was doing what most men tend to do with their fathers that have some sort of issues with their earthly fathers is I was projecting that onto God. And so the way that I saw my heavenly father too often looked like my earthly father and my earthly father that, you know, there were these issues, there were performance issues there, right? Not feeling good enough, not feeling like I had done enough, uh, not feeling like uh, I was ever going to get a, you know, a pat on the back, you know, uh, kind of deal. And again, I say all those things and it, and it almost paints my earthly father as, you know, as this, this bad father. And I don't think that at all. I just think that as fathers, you know, we all have our, our flaws. And if we take all of our flaws, which I, I did, we took and, and projected those onto our heavenly father, then like the way that I looked at being a pastor was I've got to do it all myself. I've got to, I've got to carry the weight of all of this. I've, you know, Hey, it, we had one person show up to church. That's my fault. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I didn't do enough. Or if this thing fails, it's on me, you know, uh, that kind of thing. And so uh, I hadn't dealt with any of those things. I hadn't talked about it. Um, you know, I, I hadn't even, you know, really talked much about that with my wife, uh, even at the time. And so, you know, but even she knew though, right. She, she would be saying things like, Hey, I know this is tough for you. I know, um, you know, I know you've got some things there that you need to talk about. And, and I would just close off and say, uh, you know, or, you know, excuse it away, you know, kind of things. And so I'm in one way, I kind of dealt with like the earthly part of it, but I had not dealt with the fact that I was projecting onto God, the father and, and feeling like our relationship reflected our, my earthly father's relationship. Yeah. So many people struggle with that issue and yet you never hear talk about it in the church, how, how our background or things in our past impact the present. You know, you hear talk about the father wound. You specifically mm -hmm. mentioned that. Um, yep. And you just rarely hear talk about that in the church. Why do you think that is? That's a great question, Mark. Um, you know, I, I think 
I think it's for a couple of reasons. Number one is, is I think, especially uh, for pastors, I think that uh, probably like me a lot is uh, we tend to just stuff it away, um, you know, and think that it's not an issue. Um, And, but it takes, you know, it takes getting near burnout or it takes getting near quitting and other, you know, traumatic type things for those things to come out of you sometimes. And um, pastors are pretty good. You know, we're, we're pretty good at, at not dealing with things because we think, well, I got to deal with everybody else's stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't have time to deal with my own stuff. I got to deal with everybody else's stuff. And, um, and, and it takes, it takes, it takes time for those things to be able to process or for us to, to get to a place to process those things. But I also think it takes, and you, you know, we may talk about this in a moment, but I also think it takes uh, time and space of rest and Sabbath for a pastor, which, you know, as well as I know, we're not good at those things typically. And so, um, because we don't make the time and the space for those things. And, and so therefore we don't deal with them, you know, uh, until it's too late. And then when it's too late, it's too late mm. in most cases. Yeah. Does that go back to that issue that you, that you referenced earlier? You talked about knowing yourself, that issue of self-awareness. Do, do, yeah. Does that go back to that issue of this is who I am. The, this is the past that I've had, the experience, how it impacts the present. Is that, are those connected? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I think, um, I, I think for a lot of, a lot of pastors, we, um, you know, we forget that, you know, God needs to do something in us before he does something through us. Yeah. And, and so our identity in Christ has to precede our identity for Christ. Right. And so, um, if you were to add, you know, poll 10 pastors and say, Hey, uh, tell me the last 10 books outside of the Bible. What, what are the last 10 books that you've read? Most of those books are probably going to be on how to do ministry, how to pastor, how to lead a church, you know, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we're not, we're not investing into our own soul of, you know, soul restoration. Like, like if I read a book, you know, is this for me? Like, or is it, uh, is it so I can take something to help lead our church better, which I, I get it. That's for me too, but it's different, right? Like it's not, it's not dealing with things that are d- hidden deep within my own soul. Um, and so I, I think that, that uh, I think that that is a, a huge part of it. Um, you know, that we have to understand and that was my issue is I, I, I didn't understand or I'd forgotten. This is who Jesus has made me to be. This is what he is doing in me for me, not just for my congregation, not just for the other pastors that I'm coaching and leading, but this is for me so that I know who I am in Jesus. Um, and, and that's, that's deeply, deeply important. Yeah. So how do we discover that? How do we discover who we are? Uh, how do we grow in self-awareness as oh. not just, not, not just as pastors, but even as, as, as individuals, as followers of Jesus, how do we grow in that? Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, and it's different for everybody. For me, it's called fishing trips. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but, uh, so what I mean by that though, is, is there, and pastors are notoriously bad about this. I was just talking to a pastor about this the other day and he's on sabbatical right now. And I said, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to spend that time? He's like, I, you know, I don't know. Like everything I do has something to do with the church. And I said, well, what's your, what kind of hobby do you have? I don't have a hobby. I need a hobby. Right. And, and so, um, pastors, you got, you, you all need a hobby right? Like a hobby that you do that you love and that you enjoy that's just for you. And, you know, if your spouse loves to do it with you, awesome. If your children love to do it with you, awesome. But it, but it doesn't have to be like, uh, I have a good friend of mine. He, um, you know, there's an amusement park close to us here and uh, he hates going to that place. He hates it. Like he hates the crowds. He, he doesn't ride any of the rides. Like he, he eats the food, which I get. It's awesome. Yeah. but he hates it. Right. But he does it because his family loves it. 
And so, you know, and, and so we, we had this discussion on, Hey, what are you, what are you doing for you? Like, I get that. Like I do things for my family and I do things with my family and I enjoy it and I love that. Uh, but I do it because they love it. Not necessarily because I love it. I love spending time with them. And so we can watch the grass grow. It doesn't matter. Like that's fine. But, but what are you doing for you? Right. So, uh, so just having a hobby, you know, or, and I, and I, I say this, like you, you get one hobby, <laughs> you, you, you can either have multiple hobbies or you can be married. Uh, you know, so <laughs> you, you get one, you get one hobby and uh, one that you, that you might invest in or spend time doing and that kind of thing. And so my one hobby is, is I love to fish. And so right. I don't get to do it every week. Uh, I don't get to do it. Uh, I don't get to do it as often as probably as I would love to do it. Uh, but I, that's what I do. And I go, I fish a lot by myself. So I get, I've got a kayak and I fish out of the kayak a lot. I, I take it, we get out, I get out in the middle of the lake and it's just quiet. And so, you know, it gives me time to pray. I'm, I'm, I'm probably doing things like praying and just talking to God more than I am actually fishing, but I'm enjoying that part of it too. And I feel rested when I come back. I may only be gone for two hours, but I feel rested when I come back. And so, you know, everybody's different though. Some people love to hunt. Some people love to run. Uh, some people love to exercise, you know, and those things are great. I think you need those things. I think that's part of it. But, but like, what's a hobby, um, you know, that, that you love to do and that you can, you know, spend some time doing. And so that's a, that's a big, big thing. Um, because I just don't think pastors that they excuse it away. Well, I don't have time. You know, I, yeah. I used to, you know, I used to love to fish before I started pastoring, uh, but I don't have time to do it now. Or, you know, uh, hunting season is always in this big, you know, we're always in a big campaign in our church, you know, during hunt, hunting season, you know, deer season starts here in a couple of weeks in September. Right. And so um, at least in this part of the country. And so like, I don't have time for that because this is going on. And I would just say, no, you ha you need to make time for that because if you don't, it's not going to go well for you. Yeah. And so, so what that does is this, is, it, it gives you an opportunity. If I'm listening to you correctly, it gives you a chance to get in tune with how God's wired you, you know, God's yeah. wired you, you, you like to fish. So that's a way that God has wired you. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way to put it, Mark. I think that you, you get to a place where you have, um, you have to understand again, like we said before, you have to understand who, who God has made you to be. So he has made you, I think, to enjoy certain things. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's part of it. Uh, but it also enables you to detach from, you know, the, the pressures of leadership, the pressures of, you know, whatever, you know, that, that, that you deal with. And it allows you to detach from that for a moment. Yeah. And it's a healthy thing, right? Like, you know, hopefully, you know, some, <laughs> there are a lot of unhealthy things that you could do and call it your hobby. And, and I, I would say, don't do those, right? That's bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, those aren't good, but, uh, but there are healthy things that you could do, you know, and that, that will really help you. And honestly, like you, uh, I, I've had this conversation before. It's like, well, um, you know, if I, if I spend time doing those things, then I'm not spending time with my family. Yeah. And, and I get that. I understand that sometimes you have to make a choice when it comes down to that. But I would also say sometimes the most healthy thing that you can do for your family is to invest in yourself some. Yeah. Um, because if you're not healthy, your family's not going to be healthy. Yes. And if you and your family aren't healthy, your church will not be healthy. Yeah. And so giving yourself permission to do that. So many times people yeah. think things like that. Oh, well, I can't do that. That's not spiritual. And, or, right. you know, self-care is, is not spiritual. And that's, that's a separation that we need to, we need to break. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's such a, a, a lie from the pit of hell that self-care is not, uh, is not healthy. I mean, Jesus did self-care, you know, we see moments where Jesus got away from the crowds and went and he prayed and, you know, he was away from everybody else, right? Like he, he sends his disciples on ahead of him, you know, multiple times and 
why it's it's so the brother can rest yeah. <laughs> you know like he, he was human and divine and he had that component of needing to to rest and needing to um detach you know and and just kind of be away and and that's okay and and you know some everybody's wired a little differently i I don't know how you are, Mark, but like the way that I am, like I enjoy being around people until I don't. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I get, I get excited to be in a crowd. I get excited to, to be with our church people, but then there comes a point where it's like, okay, I'm done here. Right. <laughs> like I just, I, I need, I, I need to, I need to shut it off for a few, for a little bit. And, and so typically like Sundays for us, like after church, a lot of times Sundays for us, I come home and, you know, I kind of have 30 minutes, maybe an hour, sometimes longer, just kind of depends on what's going on where we're just shut it down, you know, and because, because I'm drained from, you know, even though I enjoyed it, like I, I get a lot out of like being with our people and being with other people, but there comes a time where it's like, Hey, we got to hit stop. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so another thing that you had mentioned uh, that led to uh, burnout was just running too hard, you know, just running too hard. What did that look like? Yeah. Um, not a lot of delegation is probably what it looked like. Um, you know, it's that, that mentality of thinking, well, I can do it better than most people. And so I'll just do it myself. Right. Um, and, but what I, what I did not understand is that me trying to do it completely and totally myself was, you know, killing me, draining me and, and, and burning me out. And so, um, I, I, I was very lucky to have and still have a great, you know, uh, group of elders and, and staff people around us who would constantly say, Hey, let me do that. Let me do that. Let me do that. And there would be a lot of times where I would just say very politely and very nicely, it's like, no, no, it's okay. You know, Hey, I, I don't want to burden you. You know, I, I can do it. It's not a big deal. You know, I'm, I'm full time, you know, I'm here at the church. I, you know, I can do it. And I was, you know, and there, there, I think there's, there's something to be said, like, especially in the early days, like, yeah, you work and you work hard and you sleep about four hours and that's not healthy, but sometimes there are days where that's part of it. Right. There's a lot that has to get done and, and you have to do it because there isn't somebody else to do it. But there does come a, there does come another day where you are able to say, Hey, I don't have to do this. Either it doesn't get done and that's okay. Or somebody else does it and that's okay too. Right. And, and so, so I, I finally got to that place where I realized that I have to start giving things away to other people. I mean, even thing, and, and it's, it's such a healthy thing too. Like uh, even, even some of the most sacred things to me and to a lot of pastors, like, you know, teaching, you know, preaching mm -hmm. on, on, on a Sunday. Oh, yeah. um, we, we made a shift about five or six years ago where, uh, you know, I was teaching, I don't know, 48, 49 times a year, you know, so a majority of Sundays, which is what a lot of pastors do uh, to where now I teach about 30, 32 Sundays a, a year. Wow. Um, and so, uh, and not all the, uh, not all of the guys that get up and teach are, uh, are, you know, killing it every time they get up there, you know, on, on a Sunday, they're learning, they're new, they're, you know, We've got one guy, uh, one of our staff guys who has, uh, you know, he feels called and led to, to teach. He's preached about five sermons in his life and all five of them have been here. So, okay. <laughs> so there, and he would tell you, they're not great, but you know, but he's learning and, and the only way there, you know, there's, there's ways that, that they can learn, but at some point they got to get up there and do it. Right. Uh, and it's for me at some point, I got to say, the most healthy thing for our church is that they don't see me every Sunday or that they don't hear from me other, every Sunday. They need to hear from other people uh, because that's healthy, but it's also healthy for me because it allow it gives me space for other things. Um, not just to work on other things, but it actually it gives me space to rest too and time where I can say, Hey, I can go on vacation and not have to take a single call from our church. And it's not because we've got 30 staff members. We don't. 
it's because I'm able to say if it doesn't get done, that's okay. And if somebody else does it, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby, do you think that, that the way that we think about church specifically in America almost sets itself up for church leaders to crash and burn that, oh, yeah. that, that we put every Sunday, like you said, you know, every Sunday has to be a home run. And mm-hmm. so we, we can't, we need to make sure that every communicator is, is out of the park. They're just outstanding. You know, you referenced earlier, uh, when the fall hit, well, the fall's when you grow and when you don't grow, well, then you're a failure. Yep. And, and so do you think that we have almost built a system of doing church where uh, it just sets up leaders for this kind of experience? Yeah, for sure. For sure. We, you, you hit the nail on the head. I, I think that, um, I think the way that we do church in America is, well, we're learning right now, right? Yes. Uh, you know, so at, at the time of, of this recording, you know, yep. here we are, you know, mid pandemic, right? And we're learning that the way that we've done church for the last 40 ish years, you know, uh, has maybe longer uh, is not, uh, not conducive, right? It's not, uh, it's not great. Um, and not that God hasn't used that and, and done some amazing things with that. I, I believe that 100%. But uh, I also know that, you know, hey, every Sunday, it, it's better to be an up the middle church than it is to be a, you know, once every once in a while home run church, right? Yeah. So base, base hits are better than home runs. Yeah. You know? uh, or, you know, I'm a football guy. So, you know, a four yard carry, you know, uh, consistently every carry is better than the occasional, you know, 80 yard touchdown. Right. And so, uh, so I think that, that, you know, the pandemic for sure has helped us understand that as pastors and church leaders that, you know, if we can just be consistent and if we can do the right things um, consistently then, you know, that's, that's the way to go. That's the way to move. Uh, and, you know, so like, even with these, these guys who are teaching, you know, for their first time or, you know, um, just learning, you know, to me, the most important thing is, Hey, do you, do you, can you handle the gospel correctly? Can you, can you handle that well? And you might not have the greatest illustrations. Your personality on stage may not, you know, blow people away. Nobody's Netflix isn't calling you for to make a special, you know, next week. You know, that's fine. Um, they're not calling me either. So, it, you know, it's it's all good, right? Like, yeah. like just love the people well and care for them and shepherd them and handle handle the gospel correctly, and it'll be okay. Like mm-hmm. those other things, you know, they may come, they may not. Um, I, I think you and I would probably say, and most people would probably say that, you know, Tim Keller is not the most interesting person in the world to listen to when you listen to him preach, right? Like he's not the most dynamic person, but like the things that come out of his mouth are amazing, right? Like, I mean, just, just absolutely incredible, but it's not, you know, he's not, uh, he's not going to wow you with this, you know, amazing preaching style, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so I think that the, to back up to what you said in the beginning, yes, the way that, the way that I think that, that we've set ourselves up leads us to a place of if we don't perform, if we don't kill it Sunday, if, we, if this Sunday isn't better than next Sunday, right? Because what did we used to say, you know, uh, Mark, you and I kind of came out of the same, the same fabric. It's all about Sunday, Absolutely. right? It's all about Sunday. It's not all about Sunday. Yeah, it's really not. And and until we get that, um, you know, we're we're, we're going to continue heading full on to burnout. Yeah, I even like your example of using Tim Keller as an example because we're told that if you are a, the main communicator, if you're a preacher, then you have to have uh, this kind of personality, your introduction, you need to make sure that's captivating, full of jokes. You need to be, you need to be this kind of person. And the models that were given are not models like Tim Keller, but then you look at his fruit, 
mm-hmm. and the way that God has used him. And, yeah. it, and it speaks almost against what we're told we need to be. Yep. Yep. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I look at guys like Keller, uh, you know, Piper, um, you know, so this, some of these guys that uh, have been in the game forever, right. Uh, much longer than we have. And, and they're still doing it. You know, they're, they're still doing it. And even though both of those guys are, are retired from, from pastoring their churches, uh, I mean, they're still, they're still preaching and teaching and, you know, it, they, they start the same way. It's like, all right, first Samuel eight, here we go. You know, boom. And it's like, you know, where's the illustration to like capture my attention, you know, which I think is great too. Like Andy Stanley does an amazing job with that, right? Like he just, he just brings you in. And, every, and, and so the point of that being is that's who they are. Yes. That's the way that God has made them. And you and I, like, we, we have our own way of doing it. We've been doing it for, for a while now. And so we've kind of learned our own way of doing it. Well, these, these new guys that are coming up, and, you know, I tell them this all the time, is I, I say, you don't have to be this guy or that guy or this guy. Like you, you just need to be you. Learn from them. Gain insight and knowledge and inspiration from, from these other people. But be okay with who, with who you are and the way that you do that. Um, and, and you'll be better that way. You'll last a lot longer in this um, because of that. So what are, what's a way that a church leader, instead of just simply go, going back to the system that is, is broken, uh, what's a way that a church leader can, right there at the ground level where they are, begin to change, begin to change that, if, if for nobody else other than themselves, uh, their, their motivation, what they're looking for. What are some ways that, that, we, that we can change the system where we are? Mm, that's such a great question. You, you know, I, I think it begins, it begins again with understanding who you are in Christ, right? Mm-hmm. Just, just having a, a, a full awareness of that and embracing your flaws even, uh, understanding that, that you're not a perfect person. You're, you're never going to be a perfect person. You're going to make mistakes, uh, you know, own those and, uh, you know, don't make them on purpose, <laughs> obviously, but, you know, own them as a part of who you are, uh, and, and, and move on, you know, from there. But, but understanding that identity in the way that, that Jesus has, has wired you. So, so there's kind of like this idea of, okay, you know, what are you passionate about? Um, and how has God wired you? And then how, where that sweet spot of where those things come together, um, you know, what has he called you to? And that sweet spot of where those things come together, that's kind of who you are. That's who God has made you to be. And so operate in that sweet spot. Right. Uh, You know, I think there are too many, too many of us in ministry who are, who are operating outside of that. And so, you know, we have, we have two, like I I tell guys to do this all the time is to take, take a piece of paper and on that piece of paper, draw a line down the middle of it. And on one side, take all of the things on that one side and write down everything that just drained you. Like it just, if you had a, if you had a cup, uh, that cup is full. Every time, every time you have to do one of those things on the left side of that piece of paper, you're pouring something out of that cup. Yeah. And eventually, if all you're doing is on that left side of the paper, your cup ends up being empty, right? That's where you're, that's where burnout happens. That's where, that's where you quit that, you know, that's where you make a, 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 a moral mistake you know, Mm -hmm. um, because you're operating on the left side of that paper all the time. And so on the right side of the paper, what are those things that energize you? What are those things that fill you up that, you know, that, that really just kickstart you, uh, you know, and, and, and write down everything. Like if it's, if it's watching a great movie that you just love, like, you know, just getting lost in a great, like, write that down. Like you need to know, you need to know what those things are so that you can recognize those things, especially when it comes to church ministry. Like if, you know, uploading your church podcast every week, you know, uh, your Sunday message is one of those things that's on your task list that you have to do, but it takes you 30 minutes to do it because you hate technology right? And you're just like, I struggle every time I have to do this and I end up breaking computers because of it. 
get it off your list. You know, like it's a, it's something that drains you. And so you, you take that piece of paper and you go, okay, what on this left side, what do I need to delegate or what just doesn't need to be done? Right? Like, is, is there a meeting that I keep getting invited to that they want me to come to, but I hate going to it. I don't need to be there. Get it off your list. Like stop. Like you need, you need to get as many of those things off your list. Now there are some things that are just going to have to be there. Right. Uh, but you, you want those things. It's like, well, this is, I have to do this. Like I have to take my kids to the dentist. Like I, I hate it, but I have to go. Right. Um, sorry. That's just on your list, but there are things that you can take off your list. Right. And then on that right side, the things that fill you up and energize you like, you need to, you need to put those things down and invest time and effort and energy into doing more of those things yeah. um, than the things on the left side. That's good. That's such a, that's such a simple exercise, but the, but the payoff is, is huge. Uh, the benefits that come from something like that. Bobby, just let me ask you one more question before we wrap it up here. Uh, what would you say to the person that's, that's watching this, they're listening to this and they are in that spot. They they do not care. They have burned out. Uh, they are on the verge of making the call, writing the letter to quit, to throw in the towel. What would you say to them in this moment? Yeah, I would say, uh, number one, uh, reach out to somebody. Yeah. Um, you know, talk, talk to somebody. And I'll explain what I mean by this. Talk to somebody, not your spouse. Yet. You need to talk to your spouse for sure, but talk to someone, not your spouse. So reach okay. out to another pastor, reach out to a close friend. And I, I always tell people this too, is that like for me, uh, when I reach out to somebody and I talk to, to people, uh, I, I need to know three things about them. I need to know that they love Jesus. Number one, I need to know that they love the church, the big C church. Number two, not just my church, but the big C church, number two, and then me, number three. And I want it to be in that order because if they love Jesus and they love the church and they love me, I know that what they tell me and what the, the advice that they give me is going to be filtered through that process. And so that, that allows me to trust them a lot more, right? Like if they just love me, you know, they may not be like, bro, I don't even, why are you putting up with that? Quit. Like I, man, I'd go and I'd go sell cars. You make more money, you know, like, <laughs> I don't need that. Like that's, that's not what I need. Uh, although I think that's what I need. Right. But it's not what I need. Uh, I need to know that they love Jesus. They love the church and they love me. And so I would say, reach out to somebody. Um, and if you don't know who to reach out, uh, reach out to me, I'll talk to you. Uh, I'm sure Mark would talk to you. Like we, we would be glad to, to talk with you. Um, you know, somebody that, that has been there before. And so uh, reach out to somebody, number one, and then number two, um, talk to your spouse. Um, you know, I, that, I think that's really important too, is the, the last thing that you, the, the last thing that you want is, you know, for your spouse to be like, I didn't know that you were feeling this way, you know, and you've already turned in your resignation letter. Yeah. Um, and the truth is they probably already see it. You know, they probably already know it. Um, but you, you know, you put on the face, you know, we pull our big boy britches up and we're like, got to do it. Got to get it done. But you know, we're struggling, uh, on the inside. Mm, yeah. So that's a good word, Bobby. You, uh, so you just referenced, uh, if somebody's watching this, listen to this and they just need to talk to somebody, they can reach out to you. And so, um, that's exactly what I would encourage, uh, people who watch this, who listen to this, uh, to do if you don't follow Bobby online, Bobby, where can, uh, where can our listeners connect with you at? Yeah, uh, they can get me probably the easiest way to get me is on Twitter. Um, uh, on the, the, the Twitter verse. Is that, yeah. is that yeah. how the kids say it these days? <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, Twitter, uh, at Bobby Williams, uh, that's Bobby with a Y. So at Bobby Williams, or, uh, honestly, you can email me anytime to, uh, just Bobby, uh, uh, Bobby at churchfuel.com is a great, easy way to remember. So, um, those are two easy places to get me. Yeah. And we'll have all those links in the show notes. Uh, 
Bobby, you just now, you just referenced, uh, again, you just talked about it at the beginning, uh, church fuel. And so church fuel is a, you, you guys offer resources, but it's also a coaching program uh, that people can be a part of as well, right? Yeah, church fuel, uh, churchfuel.com is, is where you can get all the information on this. But uh, yeah, so church fuel is, uh, we make uh, insanely practical resources to, to help the pastor and the church. And so, yes, we do have resources. We have courses. We have all of those things. We're a membership program. And, uh, you, you know, this is not to, to toot our own horn, but I honestly do believe it's one of the most affordable membership programs uh, out there. Uh, it's not going to break the budget at all. In fact, we have a lot of pastors in normal sized churches, you know, churches of like less than a hundred, those are normal sized churches. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, a lot of those guys end up just paying for it out of their own pocket. Um, because it's, it's that affordable, but uh, it's not just resources. Like, yes, you can get like budgets and like sermon frames and all kinds of great resources, but it also comes with coaching and that's just part of the membership program. And so uh, whether it's me or five or six of our other coaches that we have uh, who are scattered all across the country, different size churches, different contexts, uh, you can meet with the coach every month and say, Hey, here's what's bothering me or here's an issue that we're facing, or uh, I just need somebody to bounce this idea off of. What do you think? Uh, it's, it's that too. So you get coaching, you get community and you get resources. It's a, it's a pretty good deal. That's great. That's great. And again, we'll have links to all of that in the show notes. Hey, Bobby, thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it.